Few spectacles of cinematic disaster have garnered such worthy derision as the first and second installments of the recent Atlas Shrugged film adaptation. Apparently deaf to any sound marketing advice, the trilogy's producers continue to embody the old truth that those who fail to understand the past are doomed to repeat it. Because Atlas Shrugged is one of my all-time favorite novels, I have been heartbroken beyond compare at the manner in which it has been brought to the big screen. In this video, I intend to discuss why the Atlas Shrugged film adaptation has failed and will continue to fail. First, it is critical to discuss why Atlas Shrugged became one of my favorite novels. Shortly after finishing college in 2006, I entered one of the worst job markets humanly imaginable. My skills as a musician, which had been so in demand just a few years ago, were now considered an unaffordable luxury as the economy spiraled downwards at the hands of George W. Bush. I was resigned to doing whatever work was available, which included the soul-wrenching agony of telemarketing for several months. During that time, I had no vehicle of my own and relied on the MARTA train and bus system, which afforded me extended blocks of time in transit, which I would spend reading. I read three books, Haunted by Chuck Palahniuk, Perdido Street Station by China Mayville, and finally Atlas Shrugged. Haunted was excellent, as Palahniuk always is, but Perdido Street Station, despite its excellent premise and engaging setting, left me wanting more philosophically. An avowed socialist and Marxist scholar, Mayville's stance on the common man against the big machine was an old and familiar road, and as the saying goes, familiarity breeds contempt. I wanted something radically fresh and exciting and something that might give me hope in the face of the economic downturn. In 2008, as the economy was veering off the tracks of prosperity and into the wilderness of recession, I read Atlas Shrugged. I had tried to read Atlas Shrugged previously and not been able to get very far with it. Still entrenched in the firmly left-wing ethos with which I'd been raised, I recoiled allergically at, the, at what at the time seemed like turgid prose and tended to urinate on what was good and proper. But then I came across a LibriVox recording of Anthem, which I listened through in about a day. It stunned me to no end how much of the writing resonated with me, and I could no longer deny the truth of Rand's words. Previously, my entire understanding of Ayn Rand had come from the Rush song 2112, and because of that, and because that song was inspired by Ayn Rand, I had come away with it, uh, I had come away from it with the understanding that her message was that you should work as hard as you possibly can to please other people, and if they don't like it, you should kill yourself. In other words, my understanding of Rand's philosophy was literally the opposite of what it actually was. But Anthem gave me a newfound appreciation for Rand, set in a far distant future uh, in the very world that Neil Peart had used as the basis for 2112. Anthem told the story of a janitor in a totalitarian society where collectivism had gotten to the point that the population had no concept of personal pronouns. Written as a series of journal entries, the ominous narrative begins thus. It is a sin to write this. It is a sin to think words no others are to think and put them down upon a paper no others are to see. It is base and evil. It is as if we are speaking alone to no ears but our own. And we know well that there is no transgression blacker than to do or think alone. We have broken many laws. The laws say that men may not write unless the council of vocations bid them so. May we be forgiven. But this is not the only sin upon us. We have committed a greater crime, and for this crime there is no name. What punishment awaits us if it be discovered we know not, for no such crime has come in the memory of men, and there are no laws to provide for it. It is dark here. The flame of the candle stands still in the air. Nothing moves in this tunnel save our hand on the paper. We are alone here under the earth. It is a fearful word, alone. The laws say that none among men may be alone, ever and at any time, for this is the great transgression and the root of all evil. But we have broken many laws, and now there is nothing here save for our one body, and it is strange to see only two legs stretched on the ground, and on the wall before us the shadow of our one head. The walls are cracked, and water runs upon them in thin threads without sound, black and glistening as blood. 
we stole the candle from the larder of the home of the street sweepers, we shall be sentenced to ten years in the palace of corrective detention if it be discovered. But this matters not. It matters only that the light is precious, and we should not waste it or write when we need it for that which is our crime. Nothing matters save the work, our secret, our evil, our precious work. Still, we must also write, for, may the council have mercy upon us, we wish to speak for once to no ears but our own. Our name is Equality 72521, as it is written on the bracelet which all men wear on their left wrists with their names upon it. We are twenty-one years old, we are six feet tall, and this is a burden, for there are not many men who are six feet tall. Ever have the teachers and the leaders pointed to us and frowned and said, There is evil in your bones, Equality 72521, for your body has grown beyond the bodies of your brothers. But we cannot change our bones nor our bodies. We were born with a curse. It has always driven us to thoughts which are forbidden. It has always given us wishes which men may not wish. We know that we are evil, but there is no will in us and no power to resist it. This is our wonder and our secret fear that we know, that we know and do not resist. We strive to be like our brother men, for all men must be alike. Over the portals of the palace of the World Council there are words cut in marble which we repeat to ourselves whenever we are tempted. We are one in all and all in one. There are no men but only the great we, one, indivisible, and forever. We repeat this to ourselves, but it helps us not. Immediately these words spoke to me. I had always been big for my age, reaching six feet tall around the time I was eleven or twelve, and thus looked down upon, no ironic pun intended. Other boys were jealous, girls were scared, the teachers would speak loudly and slowly to me, assuming that I had failed many times and was dense. In school my grades were very polarized. I would excel at things that interested me and struggle with things that did not. As a result, I always placed into high-level programs for reading history, language, and the arts while placing into the bottom level courses for math and science. As a footnote, I love science and would have excelled at it, but a series of droning dull teachers made it more of an exercise in resisting slumber than anything else. The sole exceptions were Mr. Hunt and Mr. Yon at my graduating alma mater, the DeKalb School of the Arts. You guys rocked. In any event, I found that uh, I found that in school, from the time I entered public school in the third grade up until the uh, until, and up until I entered the intellectually elite DSA in the eleventh grade, I encountered extreme ridicule not for being in basic math courses, but for being in accelerated literature courses. In the words of Rand, I was not hated for my shortcomings, but for my virtues. Having, ta having taken the gateway drug that was Anthem, I then delved further by watching the film adaptation of The Fountainhead. I was amazed again at how much the work spoke to me. Though I later read the novel and found it vastly superior, as most books usually are, the film, which had been scripted by Rand herself, seemed wonderfully alien to anything I'd heard before. Howard Rourke was not out to save the day or be a hero of the people. He was simply a genius architect who sought to do what he loved with his life. What was most inspiring, however, was the story. Although widely understood to be an allegory for the individual in the face of socialism, uh, seemed remarkably apolitical. Like so many who believe the straw man interpretation of Rand, I had believed that she was simply an advocate for the GOP who crafted stories out of pompous, pretentious bullshit that gullible rubes would read and vote against their own interests as a result. Nothing could be further from the truth. Rand's ideas struck hard against conservative values, casting conservatives not as the champions of free markets, but rather as the phony capitalist posers who tried to strengthen their own lame-brained adherence to blind tradition, blind faith, and militant social restrictions by attempting to align themselves with the few arguments from their intellectual superiors that vaguely resembled their own. In the past, I've been asked why I would champion Ayn Rand when she's adored by assholes like Rush Limbaugh, Glenn Beck, and others. One person even invited me to learn the truth by watching a video revealing Ayn Rand's many supporters among the GOP. The reason that this does not shake me is 
uh, is simple, and it is the same reason that Nazi support for Friedrich Nietzsche does not does nothing to shake my love of his philosophy. Both examples of groups, both are examples of groups with weak positions who attempt to attach themselves to their intellectual superiors in an effort to bolster their own agenda. Nietzsche argued that exceptional human beings were born, not made, and that the human race was evolving literally and symbolically towards a higher ideal. Such evolution, he argued, was evident in some people who he categorized as the masters, and not evident in others whom he categorized categorized as the slaves. Nietzsche's ph or Nazi philosophy erroneously interprets this to mean that white people are genetically superior and that genetic superiority must be maintained through controlled breed breeding. Nothing could be further from Nietzsche's actual philosophy, which held that while these exceptional people were few and far between, they could be persons of any race and ethnicity, and that eth ethnicity was not a factor in their excellence. The Nazis regarded Jews with the most extreme contempt possible, but Nietzsche saw anti-Semitism as one of Germany's great intellectual failures. Although he held Judeo that Judeo-Christian values were responsible for the downturn of humanity's potential, he further argued that the Jewish people themselves were praiseworthy for being strong, enduring, and ultimately thriving in the face of extreme adversity. In other words, Nietzsche was the very Jew-loving, anti-authoritarian race traitor that, were he alive in the to uh, at the time, the Nazis would have been quick to imprison for expressing anti-Reich sentiments. But because his ideas had become popular and his work carried with it a sort of sexy alternative mystique, the Nazis appropriated a few ideas that vaguely echoed their own and ignored the rest. The same is true of Ayn Rand and the GOP. I want to make it very clear at this point that I am not in any way comparing the GOP to the Nazi party. The GOP is not anywhere near competent enough to be on the level of the Nazis. But the analogy still rings true. Ayn Rand's philosophy was stridently opposed to the GOP on every level. She was an atheist. She was pro-choice. She was anti-traditionalist. She opposed the draft. She thought people should be free to fuck who they want when they want. The list goes on and on. The vague similarities between Ayn Rand's deep and well-reasoned philosophical championing of capitalism and the GOP's filthy history of cronyism and social conservatism have little in common, but when you're trying to put forth the erroneous straw man that a centrist like Barack Obama is actually a socialist waving Ayn Rand's name around is a quick and easy way to seem like you have an intellectual justification for your boneheaded argument. In recent years, the conservatives have gradually come to a dim realization of the weakness in their position, of the philosophical flaws that had to be corrected. But the means by which they are attempting to correct it are worse than the original weakness. There are three interrelated arguments used by today's conservatives to justify capitalism, which can best be designated as the argument from faith, the argument from tradition, the argument from depravity. Sensing their need of a moral base, many conservatives decided to choose religion as their moral justification. They are claiming that freedom, capitalism, and America are based on faith in God. Politically, such a claim contradicts the fundamental principles of the United States. In America, religion is a private matter and must not be brought into political issues. Intellectually, to rest one's case on faith is to concede that reason is on the side of one's enemies, to concede that there are no rational arguments to support the ideas which created this country. No rational justification for freedom, justice, property, individual rights, and they, they can be accepted only on faith. Consider the implications of that attempt. While the communists are claiming that they are the champions of reason and science, the conservatives concede it and retreat into the realm of mysticism, into another world, surrendering this world to communism. It is the kind of victories that communist irrational ideology could never have won on its own merits. Now consider a second argument, the attempt to justify capitalism on the ground of tradition. Some people declare that to be a conservative means to uphold the status quo, 
the given, the established, regardless of what it might be, regardless of whether it is good or bad, right or wrong, defensible or indefensible. They declare that we must defend the American political system, not because it is right, but because our ancestors chose it. Not because it is good, but because it is old. America was created by men who broke with all political traditions and originated a system unprecedented in history, relying on nothing but the unaided power of their own intellect. But those neoconservatives are now trying to tell us that America was the product of faith in revealed truth and of uncritical respect for the traditions of the past. It is certainly irrational to use the new as a standard of value, to believe that an idea or a policy is good merely because it is new. But it is much more preposterously irrational to use the old as a standard of value, to claim that an idea or a policy is good merely because it is ancient. The liberals are constantly asserting that they represent the future, that they are new, progressive, forward-looking, etc. And they denounce the conservatives as old-fashioned representatives of a dead past. The conservatives conceded and thus helped the liberals to pro propagate one of today's most grotesque contradictions. Collectivism and dictatorship, the frozen status society, is offered to us in the name of progress, while capitalism, the only free, dynamic, creative society ever devised, is defended in the name of passivity and stagnation. The plea to preserve tradition as such appeals to the worst elements in men and rejects the best. It appeals to fear, cowardice, conformity, self-doubt, and rejects creativeness, originality, independence, self-reliance. It is an outrageous plea to address to human beings anywhere, but the more outrageous here, in America, a country based on the principle that man must stand on his own feet, live by his own judgment, and move constantly forward as a productive, creative innovator. What do I think of President Reagan? The best answer to give would be, but I don't think of him. And the more I see, the less I think. I did not vote for him, nor for anyone else. And events seem to justify me. The appalling disgrace of his administration is his connection with the so-called moral majority and sundry other TV religionists. Thank you. Who are struggling, apparently with his approval, to take us back to the Middle Ages via the unconstitutional union of religion and politics. The threat to the future of capitalism is the fact that Reagan might fail so badly that he will become another ghost like Herbert Hoover to be invoked as an example of capitalism's failure for the next 50 years. Observe Reagan's futile attempts to arouse the country by some sort of inspirational appeal. He is right in thinking that the country needs an inspirational element, but he will not find it in the God family tradition swamp. The greatest inspirational leadership this country could ever find rests in the hands of the most typically American group, the businessmen. But they could provide it only if they acquired philosophical self-defense and self-esteem. The next question is, please clarify your comment on the moral majority. I do not understand your position. I do not understand your question. If you're here at all, you must have come because you know something about me. And if you know something about me, you know that I'm an advocate of reason, that I am not a supporter of religion, and that I despise anyone who tries to impose 
his religious ideas by force on other people. That is what the moral majority is trying. Next question is, how specifically is Reagan's conservative, pro-capitalist government helping destroy capitalism to try to stay in power? For one thing, you cannot stand in power today nor do anything politically without a well-formulated, consistent political philosophy, because it is by philosophical means that the collectivists have come to power, and you can't def defeat them except by philosophical means. And if you listen to just one of Reagan's religionists, you can forget the word philosophy. A man who claims to defend rights and objects to the right to have abortion, who wants to dictate to a woman in the most intimate, crucial and tragic issue of that kind, and he wants to forbid it, that's no defender of rights and no defender of capitalism. Incidentally, the purpose of this video is not to argue whether or not Barack Obama is a socialist, and if you try to divert the comments thread into such a discussion, you, you will be blocked and your comments removed. This is your first, last, and only warning. But back to the subject of my own experience with Ayn Rand. When I read Atlas Shrugged, I was being uh, shuttled through the sprawling metropolis of Atlanta on the MARTA subway system. In my trench coat and briefcase, I identified instantly with John Galt, the underappreciated mystery worker whose talents and abilities were shunned, ignored, and cast aside by a society more fixated on collectivist navel-gazing than real, passionate living. As I navigated the beautifully epic modernist pantheons of the MARTA subway stations, I became aware of of those persons around me who seemed lost, dejected, and unfocused. I realized that until recently I had been lost in, those, in that same hopelessness, the hopelessness that makes characters in the novel wearily ask who is John Galt when life seemed impossible. I further identified with this mysterious Galt character as I moved through the crowds of people jockeying for position on the next train just like the rest of them. I imagined what it must be must have felt like for John Galt to be moving anonymously among the crowds, his mind buzzing with an earth shaking philosophy. The novel gave me a great deal to think about and my worldview was forever altered. There are still certain aspects of Ayn Rand that I dislike, for example, her belief that homosexuality was fundamentally immoral, or that she appeared as a friendly guest at Joe McCarthy's witch hunt hearings. But those are minutia compared to the larger impact of her ideas, that it is right for a man to live for himself, that self-interest is not the abandonment of morality, but the basis of morality, that it is the mind, not force or collective will, that moves the world, that money is the root of all good, and that free market that capitalism could actually bring about world peace, and that it is the mind, not faith in mystics of spirit or muscle, which one should rely on. These are profound ideas, and she argues them well. Now let us look at how the film not only fails to argue them, but betrays and contradicts her very values. <laughs> The story of Atlas Shrugged begins in a dystopian near future America in which government control of the market and the worldwide spread of communism, socialism, and other collectivist interests has reached such a fever pitch that the world seems to be grinding to a halt. Mysteriously, the great philosophers, artists, musicians, businessmen, inventors, mathematicians, and other intellectual giants are vanishing left and right, often closing down their businesses or abandoning them outright. In the midst of this chaos, we meet Dagny Taggart, a railroad executive who works tirelessly to further the interests of Taggart Transcontinental, the family's business empire legacy, while saving it from the corrupt hands of her incompetent brother, James, and his government cronies. 
Throughout the course of the novel, characters both major and minor express their disillusionment with the state of the world by saying, who is John Galt, a phrase whose significance is understood more and more throughout the novel. I don't wish to ruin the book for those who haven't read it, so I'll say here and now that I'm going to spend the rest of this video speaking directly to those who have read Atlas Shrugged, or at least seen the first two films. There will be spoilers along the way, although I don't think they'll diminish your appreciation of the book. I don't normally like to be the sort of Simpsons comic book store guy type of person who sits on the internet posting endlessly about the minute failings of various movies, but in this case it is crucial to understand just exactly why this film series is ruining the story, message, and artistry of Atlas Shrugged. To begin, I have to admit that the first film did have certain elements that I liked. Taylor Schilling captured the essence of Dagny Taggart perfectly, a sympathetic, at times wonderfully compassionate character who still comes off as an ice-cold, cutthroat bitch to all who dare stand in her way. A pleasure. Thank you. Dagny, this is uh, Mr. Brady, a delegate from the Union of Locomotive Engineers. You're busy. I'll be brief. We're not going to allow you to run that train on the John Galt line. Get out of here. You do not come into my office and tell me what you will or will not allow what me to do. What I meant to say was that a committee has decided that allowing men to run your train on that untested metal would violate their human rights. Are you serious, Mr. Brady? You can't force men to go out and get killed just for profit. Put that in writing. That you want to stop your men from working and earning a wage. Miss Taggart, you don't understand. Oh, no, 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 I understand perfectly. You want me to provide the jobs, and you want to make it impossible for me to have any jobs to provide. You can do whatever you want with your men, Mr. Brady, but that train will run if I have to drive the damn thing myself, because, Mr. Brady, if that bridge collapses, there won't be any railroad left in existence. But if it does not collapse, no member of your union will ever get a job on the John Galt line. Now, are you going to forbid your men to run that train? I never used the word forbid. I'm only stating that you cannot force anyone to take that run. I would never force a man to do anything. I'll ask for volunteers. Then it will be my problem, not yours. I advise them to refuse. Do what you want, Mr. Brady. But leave them the choice. We see in Schilling's Dagny someone who loves life, understands the virtues of capitalism, and is truly pained by the downturn of society. The writers didn't give Dagny or any of the characters as much depth as they had in the novel, but I did get the feeling that Taylor Schilling understood the character and did the best she could with what she was given to work with. Unfortunately, what she was given to work with is quickly betrayed by the screenwriters. At the wedding anniversary, Lillian Reardon asked Dagny, who? are you wearing? A question which Dagny actually answers. This might seem like a minute matter, but it's an abundance of moments like these that cause the film to misrepresent the characters. In the novel, there's an epic flashback which details Dagny's growing up and her torrid relationship with Francisco D'Anconia. During this sequence, we see Dagny's mother fretting at length about how her daughter is a self-absorbed tomboy that's more interested in the inner workings of trains and railroads than learning to act like a proper young lady. When the teenage Dagny has her debutante ball, she's bored by the whole affair and unimpressed with the boys that attend. This is crucial in the character's development. It establishes who Dagny is, what she values, and why she acts the way she does as an adult. To portray Dagny as having an interest in banal matters of women's fashion contradicts the single-minded focus on business that, in the story, draws her to Hank Reardon as a lover. In the novel, it makes sense that, Dag that Hank and Dagny gravitate to one another at the party. They are the only two people there with any degree of depth or intellect. In the film, their interaction seems almost random and arbitrary. The character is further botched when Dagny, meeting with Hank Reardon, comments that she's gambling that his new metal can do what he says it can. But in the novel, she wasn't gambling. She was absolutely certain that the new metal could live up to the hype. 
The point was that she'd used her mind to see the truth that the mystics of muscle were unable to see because they refused to use their minds. To say that she's just hoping to get lucky contradicts her character. Dagny, along with Reardon, Francisco, Galt, and others, represent a philosophical opposition to the kind of people who stake their lives, careers, and goals on random chance, emotional whims, etc., Without the certainty of knowing that Reardon metal would work, we are unable to be inspired by Dagny and, stand, and her defiant stand against the ignorance and misinformation of the collectivists. Moments later, Dagny asks Hank if he would like a ride home. He declines, saying he walks home most nights. Once again, the character is wasted with a single line. In the novel, Hank is choosing to walk home because he's just watched the first order of his new metal being poured, and he wants to relish his triumph. As he walks home, we feel the magnificent sense of triumph at what Hank has accomplished, which is why, when he comes home to his ungrateful, freeloading family, we truly feel just how devastating it is to live with them day after day, and truly come to hate them for their inability to appreciate what he's accomplished. Roger Ebert was right about the film not being entertaining. It's a vague overview of some of the things that happened in the book, but without the real emotional and psychological meat that made it that made all those business deals, board meetings, and cocktail parties so surprisingly captivating and riveting in the original text. I do wish, however, to acknowledge the architecture. In both films, I did enjoy many of the exterior shots of various modern buildings and the contemporary look many of the offices had. That's not saying much, however, as even that failed the source material at times. Little can be said on Samantha Mathis's performance of Dagny in Part 2. Where Schilling at least captured the character, Mathis breathes no life into her role, instead seeming half asleep and confused throughout. She simply lacks the ruthlessness, conviction, and sex appeal necessary to play the character and delivers her lines in a nearly monotonous recitation. It's not so much that she plays the character incorrectly, but rather that she doesn't play the character or any character at all. Grant Bowler brings little to the character of Hank Reardon, and he comes off more as a stock businessman with a detached, mild sense of good humor, not the passionate, dignified ideal written of in the novel. The result, again, is that the viewer does not connect with Reardon in any meaningful way. We know that he's a sympathetic character haggard by the annoyances of the world, but we don't rejoice in his triumphs and grit our teeth at his losses the same way we would in the book. Jason Begee corrects this problem considerably in the second film, presenting Hank with a tough, unflappable demeanor, beautifully complemented by his gravelly voice and oddly warm sense of sarcastic humor. Begee's performance highlights just how far the rest of the second film falls short. Begee dominates his scenes, actually giving Hank Reardon the commanding presence he deserves, but against a backdrop of listless, half-assed performances from the other actors, he only serves to remind us of what the film could have been if it had been cast entirely with skilled A-list performers like Mr. McGee. Another central failing in the character development was in both performances of James Taggart. In the first film, Matthew Marsden is entirely too commanding in the role and does not appear the least bit haggard. These are two central elements of the character that cannot be omitted. In the novel, James Taggart is introduced by rushing into his office, closing the door, slumping down in his chair, and muttering a sort of prayer that nobody will come to bother him. It is then observed that Taggart looks as though he's in his 50s when he's actually only in his 30s. Matthew Marsden has none of these characteristics. He's vibrant, young, and engaging. A critical failure is his delivery of the line, nobody has ever used Reardon metal, why should we be the first? Marsden delivers these lines firmly and stridently, which defeats the character. James Taggart does not simply oppose his sister Dagny, rather he is pushed into opposing her by those who manipulate him. Taggart himself is too limp-wristed and timid to actually take a strong stance on anything. A more accurate delivery of this crucial line would have been, Nobody has ever used Reardon Metal. Why do we have to be the first? Patrick Fabian only further denigrates the character in Part 2. Rather than failing the 
character by portraying him as confident and charming, as in Mar Marston's performance, Fabian pushes the outer extremes by presenting James Taggart as a charming, extroverted, cocky socialite who seems extremely comfortable in his own skin. Because the James Taggart plot thread is a swift downward arc into complete mental breakdown, it's frustrating to see him as only mildly flustered at best. But once again, several critic, critical elements fail in part two with regards to James Taggart, and they all revolve around Taggart's relationship with his wife-to-be, Cheryl Brooks. Like in the book, Taggart meets Cheryl in a rundown bargain price convenience store. In the book, however, Taggart staggers into the store to buy tissues because he's fighting bitterly with a cold and he's too incompetent to even blow his own nose. We see that his character feels that reality is fundamentally against him, and this is critical to establishing him as a character. He falls in love with Cheryl, an employee at the store, precisely because he realizes that she's too naive to see that he's actually incompetent. This is lost in the movie, however, where he seems cool and collected in the discussion with Cheryl. Additionally, he isn't buying Kleenex in the movie, instead he's shopping for ties, which begs the question, why is a wealthy billionaire shopping for ties at a bargain price convenience store? It might be tempting to say that he's doing this to feel connected to the common people that he wants to help, but that only further defies the nature of his character. James is incapable of feeling close to anybody, even superficially. To portray him as having any genuine social depth at all is to betray the character. He can't be capable of forming genuine bonds because it's this very ineptness that leads to him to cronyism as a substitute for real human connection. As is pointed out in the book, James is unwilling to break ties with Oren Boyle because he considers the man a friend, despite Oren Boyle reneging on business promises to the point that it's ruining Taggart Transcontinental. A further betrayal of the novel comes in part two when James Taggart invites Cheryl Brooks to see a live piano performance by Richard Halley. This represents a failed understanding of the source material on many, many levels. First of all, in the novel, James doesn't like to take Cheryl out at all. He prefers to sit in her apartment and have her listen to long-winded rants about how he's the one who does everything at Taggart Transcontinental while his sister takes all the credit, the complete reverse of reality. And this establishes James' existence uh, as not just one of incompetence, but a willful ignorance of reality. Next comes a moment in the James Taggart story thread that burns me since the actual narrative was one of my favorite parts of the book. In the film, James's first date with Cheryl is to a concert, uh, concert by Richard Halley. Supposedly, Halley is playing a rhapsody, although as a professional musician, I can tell you there's nothing rhapsodic about the skillfully played jumble of notes that the film's Halley burns through. More on the soundtrack later. Anyway, in the book, it's Dagny that's a fan of Richard Halley, and with very good reason. Richard Halley's music appeals to Dagny because, her, because of her sense of life. Dagny desires passionately to live life to the fullest and sees her own happiness as her highest moral achievement. In the novel, Halley's music has gone unappreciated for years in favor of untalented hack composers because his music speaks to the sense of life felt uh, by people like Dagny, while the world at large is consumed with a sense of aimless, abstract mystery, which, unable to define, they lament with the novel's classic catchphrase, who is John Galt. It is absolutely wrong for James Taggart to attend a concert by Richard Halley. James Taggart is not capable of appreciating the music of Richard Halley or enjoying the world at all. That is why, in the novel, most of his dating of Cheryl Brooks consists mainly of sitting in her, in her apartment making her listen to his constant, unending complaining. The origin of this feeling is outlined in the novel. James Taggart has no sense of purpose in life and, as a result, has no ability to feel happiness, love, connection to others, etc. There is a critical scene towards the beginning of the novel in which James Taggart wakes up in bed with his mistress. They begin sluggishly moving around the room, getting cleaned up and dressed for the day, neither one of them having any real drive. They don't enjoy having sex or partying or any of the things they do. They simply do them because they feel it's what they're supposed to do. Rand wrote about how such people as James and his mistress go through the motions of a celebration because they think that if they do, it will give them something to celebrate. 
Rand is arguing that non-causal emotion is not emotion at all, but simply a performance of the physical actions that would proceed from that emotion. James has no reason to live, and as such, no reason to enjoy what life has to offer. As he prepares in the bathroom, however, he begins talking to his mistress about the plan he has put in place to control Dagny, and he is suddenly alive and full of life because now he has a purpose. And that is why Rand condemns people like James as second-handers. The people who lack the ability to enjoy their lives derive their sense of purpose from the destruction of people who actually do enjoy their lives. It is further worth noting here that Richard Halley is given no backstory in the film. In the novel, he has already disappeared when the story begins, and the nature of his disappearance from society is only referred to in flashbacks. Halley had composed an opera about the Greek deity uh, Phaeton, who infamously attempts to steer Zeus's chariot and is killed by Zeus's punishment. In Halley's version, Phaeton does not fail to still steer the chariot, but rather instead masters it, and this enrages the composer's audience that he would dare to rewrite this legend. When Halley disappears, it is because after struggling in obscurity for many years after the failure of Phaeton, the opera is suddenly successful and praised as music of the people. Perplexed by the sudden, bizarre reaction to his music on opening night of on the opening night of Phaeton's new production run, Haley is approached by John Gall to explain, to summarize, that Halley's music is now being celebrated because of all of the pain and suffering that Halley went through, that their acceptance of his music is really their own celebration of Halley's misery. None of this is explained in the film. On screen, Halley simply finishes his incomprehensible piano solo and the curtain closes. John Galt is heard off camera asking Halley if he is ready, and then when the curtain opens for the bow, the piano bench is empty and a note card is left behind which says who is John Galt. The filmmakers further fail to understand what Halley's music is supposed to sound like. His music is intended to capture the majesty and wonderment that Dagny feels at being alive and express a deep passion for living. The random chaotic jumbles of notes that Halley plays in the film seem more like the kind of symphonies that, in the novel, Dagny despises because they are non-melodic screeching and chaos. Time and again, the filmmakers seemed bold and determined to portray these characters as exactly the opposite of what they're supposed to be. Returning to James, he marries Cheryl Brooks in the film and the novel, but in the film we are given no reason as to why he is marrying her. They are simply and suddenly getting married. In the novel, James takes Cheryl to a social function, and because she has no concept of high society fashion, she ends up wearing the wrong type of dress for the occasion and embarrasses herself and James at the event. When he takes her home that night, he proposes. This, again, is critical. Why does James marry Cheryl? It's not because he truly loves her. He is not capable of actual love. It's not because he wants to help her. He doesn't know how to help anybody. He marries Cheryl precisely because she's an embarrassment. He believes that he believes that to be moral he must suffer, and she facilitates his suffering. This is completely lost in the film, as is any semblance of an accurate portrayal of James Taggart. James Taggart stands alone in the world of literary villains because he is not motivated by his own sense of right and wrong. Rather, he is manipulated by others who, he believes, will make him moral if he follows their commands. None of this comes across in the film. But for all of the betrayal of James Taggart, none of it holds a candle to the horrific way in which the film butchers Francisco D'Anconia. Esu Garcia played the character well enough in the first film, carrying the demeanor of one who is, on the surface, a playboy while being deeply conflicted at heart, but I think this only comes across if one knows the full backstory of the character. We see no such backstory in the first or second film, only a few mentions of Francisco at one point having been Dagny's boyfriend. It is crucial to understand why Dagny was in love with Francisco, because otherwise it makes no sense why Dagny would be so attracted to a mindless playboy, someone whose values are the complete opposite of her own. As a result, the failure to fill out the character of Francisco works to the detriment of both characters and the philosophy as a whole. 
In the novel's backstory, Francisco and Dagny are childhood playmates who grow up to become young lovers. They are drawn to one another because they both share a fascination with business and, although they only have an intuitive understanding of it, the philosophy of capitalism that propels economics and society forwards. Both are heirs to major global fortunes, Taggart Transcontinental and Dianconia Copper. They challenge one another to see who will achieve the most for their respective namesakes. Francisco faces a very daunting task. His family's copper company has existed for hundreds of years, and they will not simply hand the family business over to him. Rather, he must start a successful rival company, which they will then buy out and make him the head of their enterprise. Francisco accomplished this, accomplishes this in the novel with flying colors, taking over Dianconia Copper and carrying it forward with ease. Then one evening, he mysteriously appears at Dagny's office at Taggart Transcontinental and explains that she will, in short, start to see him change into a very different person. Although vague and clearly conflicted about this strange transition, Francisco gives Dagny an important clue when he says, quote, Contradictions do not exist. Whenever you think you are facing a contradiction, check your premises. You will find that one of them is wrong. Close quote. Uh, Francisco de Anconia in uh, Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged, Part 1, Chapter 7. This observation introduces the concept of non-contradiction and the law of identity. Non-contradiction is crucial to Rand's philosophy, and without it being firmly established or reflected in the narrative, the story will inevitably fall flat. It is required that we know that Francisco started out as a sincere and dedicated young businessman who was not only capable but exceptional in his abilities. From there forward, we are left to puzzle at his bizarre actions, that he has not only become a worthless playboy, but seems to be doing everything in his power to ruin the business he once was so proud of. His facade is successful, with Dagny and Hank Reardon aghast at the decadence into which he has fallen. Without establishing the character's origin and backstory, the Playboy persona makes no sense in the first film, but the sudden shift into flippant economics professor in the second film is further baffling. James Taggart's wedding party is a critical scene on many levels in the story, not the least of which is what is revealed about Francisco. When he arrives on the scene, he is generally regarded with disdain and is ignored. Francisco then confronts Taggart openly on recent pol uh, political polls, and when he does, the room falls silent and the crowd stands aside. Francisco is suddenly the center of attention, and in stark contrast to the loose and lazy playboy he was believed to be, now is now a striking and confident figure that commands respect and attention. It is here that Francisco delivers what is referred to as the money speech, a thorough, and br thorough brilliant, and revelatory treatise on the philosophical virtue of money. It is at this point that the abstract philosophical principles of the novel begin to be tied in to the concrete economic terms of capitalism, and it is at this moment that Francisco hints that the playboy persona might simply be a front for a more significant scheme. This is proven to be correct. All along, Francisco has been working as an agent for John Galt, taking the necessary actions to destroy the world's economy and free the producers from the looters and the moochers. In the second film, Francisco is played dubiously by Isai Morales, who exudes neither the confident brilliance of Francisco nor the wallowing playboy decadence of his false persona. Instead, Morales simply projects the character as a stock Spanish person who feels deeply concerned about something. When the time comes for Morales to give the famous money speech, he does not command the room at all. He is shown pushing his way through the crowd, and considering that Morales is somewhere between 5'8 and 5'10, he is noticeably smaller than most of the on-screen characters, including many of the women. He delivers a few quotes from the money speech in a stumbling, seemingly drunken rant that does nothing to capture even the basic essence of the ideas. This limp, impotent blathering of a few lines of the speech only serves to further betray the character of the story and the philosophy. In the same scene, Francisco announces to the party 
that the business interests of D'Anconia Copper have taken a nosedive, which sends an entire room full of corrupt investors running panicked out of the room to conduct emergency damage control. This portion of the scene is left out of the film entirely, and instead the scene simply transitions into the next with no real tension built to propel the action forwards. In the novel, Francisco's gleeful, almost sadistic informing of the room that his business is about to collapse and their investments ruined carries the effect of Rome burning while Nero plays a fiddle. A moment of outstanding drama that could have been easily filmed is instead ignored, and this, among many other missed opportunities, turns the film into a sluggish snooze fest. These are just a few critical examples of characters taking actions that are either contrary to the nature of their characters or actions that are unexplained and unmotivated. This represents a central betrayal of Rand's philosophy. Man may permit no breach between body and mind, thought and action. But of all of the character failings, none are so critical and so devastating as that of John Galt himself. It is here, again, that I will caution that those who have not read the novel and do not wish the story spoiled uh, be advised to stop, because I will now discuss the differences between John Galt in the novel and John Galt in the films. These differences fall into three betrayals of the character, those of presentation, those of action, and those of philosophy. Because John Galt represents Rand's <clears throat> ideal for humanity, an unprecedented level of care must be taken in his transferal to the screen. His values mirror perfectly the values of the novel and the values of the author. To fail at representing him perfectly is to fail at representing the story, the philosophy, and the vision correctly. Ayn Rand spent two years just writing John Galt's epic speech. The filmmakers have not shown the character one one billionth of the care and craft he deserves. First, there is the matter of John Galt's physical appearance. In the novel, he is tall, slender, blonde-haired, and blue-eyed. When the novel was still being considered for production by a major Hollywood studio, Brad Pitt was on the short list to play John Galt. He certainly captures the physical characteristics well, but he also embodies the spirit of the character. John Galt's persona is built off of the premise that he experiences happiness on the basis of Ayn Rand's definition of happiness, which is a state of non-contradictory joy. Part of what makes Brad Pitt enjoyable to watch on the screen is his ability to radiate this sort of sense of life. Watching him in the films, in films like Seven Years in Tibet, A River Runs Through It, Legends of the Fall, and others, shows us that he is capable of giving his characters the kind of light, free-spirited embrace of life that Ayn Rand championed in her books. But Pitt is a dynamic actor, and he is equally capable of delivering the dark, conflicted, and disturbed characters found in Fight Club, Seven, and Twelve Monkeys, as well as the shrewd, cold-hearted, aristocratic demeanor seen in Interview with a Vampire, all elements that would have helped capture the full breadth and width of the John Galt character. Instead, we are given two actors, and the one that we see is visually incompatible with the description of John Galt. D.B. Sweeney might have been an acceptable choice to play John Galt 20 years ago, but as it stands he's, now, he's simply too old. His eyes, while blue, seem beady and sunken in. His chin now lacks its notable cleft and is instead soft and rounded. He seems world-weary and meek in his modern demeanor, but even at the height of his fame, he failed to leave much of a mark. I've seen quite a few of his films, including Fire in the Sky, Spawn, the Darwin Awards, and even his episode of House, but he still didn't leave enough of a mark to make him memorable to me at all. By contrast, I immediately recognized Ray Weiss from his deranged and terrifying role in Twin Peaks and his satirical, lovable devil persona in Reaper. It's simply a matter of one actor having the on-screen power to stamp a mark on your memory. Mercifully, D.B. Sweeney's on-screen time is limited to about 90 seconds, and his entire face isn't even shown. For the most part, he is heard off-camera asking various characters, Are you ready? I don't recall this from the book, which I've read multiple times, and it contradicts the character immensely. John Galt doesn't have to go around asking people if they are ready. 
He knows when they're ready to leave and go on strike. That's why he doesn't take Dagny and Reardon. They haven't yet come fully to come to fully and correctly embrace his philosophy. They both want to save the world as it presently exists, while John Galt and his accomplices want to leave the world to collapse in the hands of the looters and the moochers, only to return when the government and the society that supports it have collapsed completely. When we finally see Sweeney's Galt on screen, it is as he arrives to help Dagny out of the wreckage of her plane where he asks, Are you ready? just as the screen fades to black and presents the closing credits. This is another crucial failure of the character. In the novel, Galt and several other characters in the Gulch explain that Dagny was not welcome there. She had not been invited, and Galt had not judged her to be ready to join the strikers. For Galt to ask her if she's ready is to, one, negate his reason for not inviting her along already, and two, his reason for inviting the people that he did. This undercuts the central philosophy that establishes why these characters and not others are chosen. If any person is welcome to Galt's Gulch simply by arriving there, then it defeats the purpose of hiding the place in the first place. In just a few seconds of screen time and probably less than a page of script, the creators of Part 2 have completely dismantled the John Galt character, taking him from an epic visionary who withdraws the critical people from society so that the rest collapses under brutal collectivism, and instead turning him into a mysterious crank who built a secret country club in the Rocky Mountains for rich people. In other words, they've turned him into the very straw man that Ayn Rand's detractors accuse him of being. Most despicably, there is a small but deafening failure in the way John Galt answers Dagny's request for his name. In the novel, he simply says, John Galt. In the film, he says, I am John Galt. The unaware might dismiss this as minutia, but once again, it is crucial in presenting the character. In the novel, John Galt gives his name simply as an answer to a question. We, the reader, are meant to feel, it, feel a chill wash over us at the realization that this is who people have been referring to all this time. But Galt is indifferent to the worldwide fame uh, the question, who is John Galt, has acquired, and he's indifferent to the almost deific significance he holds in the eyes of the producers. Galt is complete in himself. He simply wants to live his life and achieve his own goals and his own happiness. The notoriety, grandeur, and mystique that arises is unimportant because other people's opinions of him are meaningless to him. This goes out the window when Sweeney rasps, I am John Galt. With those two extra words and the almost comical emphasis on the am, Sweeney makes the statement carry a tone of, oh yeah, baby, I'm that badass that everyone's talking about. I'm the one that's been doing all this crazy wild-ass shit that you've been puzzled about all these years. You in my world now, biatch. Sweeney seems to think that he's playing a white version of Morpheus from The Matrix, and it's truly embarrassing to watch. Later in the novel, when John Galt gives his epic speech over the radio, he says, For twelve years you have been asking who is John Galt. This is John Galt speaking. At this point, Galt does acknowledge the significance of his role in the world crisis, but it doesn't come across as gloating or grandstanding. As the novel describes his speech, it was not the tone of addressing a meeting, but the tone of addressing a mind. Here, Galt is simply clarifying his identity for the sake of clarifying the significance of the ideas he is about to present, not for some narcissistic self-aggrandizement. His voice is intended to inspire intellectual clarity, not dumbstruck awe. But all of these sickening, pitiful failures pale in comparison to the cartoony depiction of John Galt in the first film. In the novel, Galt remains unseen and enigmatic until the final third of the story, pulling strings in the background and mysteriously causing the motor of the world to grind to a halt. As the story opens, the world's producers are simply vanishing into thin air, and we, the reader, are given no indication as to why this adds to the suspense and the mystery. We are meant. Hey, y'all, I need to do a quick punch in right here. Um, I said we are given no indication as to why, and this adds to why this adds to the suspense and the mystery. What I should have said was we are given no indication as to why 
and this adds to the suspense and the mystery. So grammatical, small grammatical error, but it speaks volumes if it's heard incorrectly. Anyway, carry on me. To feel that the world is plummeting hopelessly into ruin without these great minds, and we are meant to feel the desperation Dagny feels as she watches the outstanding individuals of the world mysteriously disappear. Then, after many pages of inexplicable disappearances, Dagny arrives for a meeting with Ken Daniger and is told that Daniger has been in his office talking to a strange man for several hours. After a time, Dagny begins to worry that this unscheduled meeting might have something to do with the disappearance of the producers, and she is correct. Ken Daniger is meeting with John Galt, who is presenting the philosophy that will convince Daniger to go on strike and leave for Galt's Gulch. Dagny storms into the room, narrowly missing Galt, who is leaving through the side door. Sure enough, Daniger is ready to give up and leave his business, and for the first time, we begin to see the root cause of the pattern of disappearances. This creates dramatic tension throughout the story, and Rand is masterful beyond compare at gradually peeling back the layers, and her process in doing this is so utterly fascinating that it makes me willing to plow, it makes me willing to plow through the novel's 1,200 pages time and time again. I should emphasize, so that there is no confusion, that Daniger does not reveal the identity of the man he has been speaking with, which is central to the suspense of the story. And while this does not happen in the film either, the man's identity is already ruined after the first film. Well, we don't get this sense of mystique in the first film. Instead, we see John Galt going up to one person after another directly, and it becomes quickly apparent that whoever this person is, he's the one who's convincing all the producers to go on strike. It's as if the filmmakers were so obsessed with having this unnamed figure spout elementary-level libertarian platitudes that they totally forgot how to tell the story, assuming they knew in the first place. <clears throat> The very worst of these quickie conversations perpetuated by the first film's uh, John Galt comes at the end when the character is somehow able to walk up to the front door of the home of Ellis Wyatt, one of the richest men in the world, and convince him to set his oil fields on fire and leave with him in the middle of the night. Yes, in the novel, Wyatt sets his oil fields on fire, and yes, he leaves with John Galt, but to portray this as happening in one night after hearing the hearing a one-paragraph monologue from a total stranger is utterly absurd. And what's worse, the filmmakers blow the whole secret by showing Galt there in person, delivering this laughable simplification of his intentions. Quote, My name is John Galt. I live in a place we call Atlantis, and I think you'd fit in there. It's a place where heroes live, where those who want to be heroes live. The government we have there respects each of us as individuals and producers. Actually, beyond a few courthouses, there's not much of a government at all. Bottom line, Mr. Wyatt, if you're weary of a government that refuses to limit its power over you, and if you are ready at this moment to claim the moral right to your own life, then we should leave and I'll take you there. I'll take you to Atlantis. Close quote. Shortly thereafter, we hear a voiceover of Wyatt's answering machine in which he declares that he is on strike. Well, great. Now we definitely know what's going on. John Galt has been convincing the producers of the world to go on strike so that the looter state will collapse. So when then does Galt, or why then does Galt even need to talk to Ken Daniger for several hours in part two? Why doesn't he just utter a few magical phrases like he did in the first installment? The filmmakers obviously don't understand that putting John Galt in silhouette and hiding his face isn't enough to make him mysterious. He has to remain absent altogether, his legend built up in rumors and hidden meanings until the world of the novel and we the readers are truly ready to learn who he is. And what's worse, the silhouettes frequently don't reflect the actual lighting of the scene. Here, Galt and Midas Mulligan are standing under the same lighting arrangement, yet the details of Mulligan are visible while Galt is just a single-toned profile. 
Here, Galt is somehow shadowed by light that fully illuminates everyone else. Almost everything about John Galt is given away in the first film, and as a result, there's nothing left to be surprised by except Galt's face, and since the cast changes in every movie, even keeping that a secret doesn't really matter. And with John Galt failing to be accurately realized on screen, the effects of his strike are predictably absent as well. The effects of Galt's strike began with the 20th Century Motor Company, where Galt was employed a decade prior to the start of the story. A young and ambitious inventor, he created a motor which would allow him to harness the atmospheric energy of the Earth for human use, creating an eco-friendly, infinitely renewable power source. The 20th Century Motor Company was founded by Jed Starnes and was, an exceedingly was exceedingly successful with the surrounding town of Starnesville springing up in response to the company's prosperity. When, St when the Starnes heirs, three insipid Trustafarians, take over, take over, they attempt to socialize the company, paying according to need, not ability. This causes the company and the entire town to collapse, and John Galt disappears, his motor forgotten. In the novel, when Dagny and Reardon arrive in Starnesville, they find not only a closed, run-down factory that would appeal to urban explorers the world over, but a town that has fallen into near-apocalyptic ruin. Horse-drawn carts have replaced most cars to the point that when Dagny and Reardon drive into town, people actually stop and stare. Few homes have electricity, and the local economy is slim to nil. One scene that interested me personally was when Dagny and Reardon are told by a town official to go to the local dime store and buy a fake diamond ring for Dagny because unmarried men and women traveling together aren't welcome. This was interesting to me because here Rand seems to be pointing out how primitive attitudes proceed from a technologically primitive culture. Also, the town is so deeply entrenched in collectivist ideals that the citizens see fit to interject into each other's lives in this manner. In the course of attempting to find out what happened, the pair, and later just Dagny, meet various people who worked with the 20th Century Motor Company and describe the horrors of the horrors perpetuated by the Starnes children. We eventually meet two of the Starnes children, the first having committed suicide sometime before the beginning of the story. Of the surviving two, Gerald Starnes has fallen into alcoholism, and Ivy Starnes lives a sad hermetic life devoted to Eastern mysticism. In the film, we see a series of reasonably affluent no-names waxing about the failure of the company, but they don't seem to be that upset about the whole matter. Ivy Starnes lacks any menacing qualities at all, short of describing her father as a monster, which, if you don't understand Ivy Starnes to be the real monster, makes little sense. The critical scene at the end of part one, both in the novel and the film, is Dagny's arrival at Hugh Axton's diner. Hugh Axton was John Galt's philosophy professor at Patrick Henry University and a surrogate father figure to Galt. His relevance to the story is treated as insignificant in the film, just one of many faces in the montage of interviews Dagny conducts to locate the creator of the motor. Additionally, this time the this is the first time we see a cigarette with a dollar sign, which is crucial because in the novel, Dagny has spent the entire story up to this point finding cigarettes stamped with a dollar sign all around and wondering who is leaving them. Well, it's John Galt, and this is imp an important element to set up the story because it hints at the truth. Ever since walking out of the 20th Century Motor Company, he's been working for Taggart Transcontinental as a low-level grease monkey while secretly monitoring Dagny and executing his plan. But what do the cigarettes mean in the film? Nothing. This is the first time we're seeing one, and so focusing in on it makes no sense whatsoever, especially since they aren't reintroduced in Part 2, in part two, however, is a critical scene where Dagny learns the origin of the phrase, who is John Galt. In the novel, it occurs when Dagny finds a homeless bum on her train and takes him into her private car for dinner. While they talk, the phrase comes up and he explains that it originated at the 20th Century Motor Company when a young engineer named John Galt stood up and walked out on the meeting uh, in which socialist policy was announced. The bum's subsequent narrative tells of how the Starnes heirs not only ruined the company and the town, but the lives of the people, and 
uh, lives of the people to an inhuman degree. It is here that we are given a dark, horrific, and unflinching look into the evil of the concept of making ability serve need. It is explained in the bum's account that the only way anyone could survive in the company was to be as needy as possible, and a race, from, a race to the bottom occurred with couples marrying and having children just to increase their dependence and thus their take. The bomb implies that this became so bad that factory workers resorted to killing pregnant mothers and babies just to keep need as low as possible. It is a dark, disturbing tale that hammers home just what happened when John Galt left and took his mind with him. In both the novel and the film, this character was a former employee of the 20th Century Motor Company, but what changes is how Dagny meets this character. In the film, Dagny meets him when her train breaks down and he, now a Taggart employee, comes out to work on it. On the one hand, this is actually a better means of introducing the character. In the novel, it's left up to random chance that the bum happens to be huddled outside the door to Dagny's private car, but this gives them an actual reason to meet, although even that falls flat when you stop to think that it's still pretty random that her train broke down in just the right place and at just the right time to meet this character. Nevertheless, presenting the character this way ruins the effect of the story. The point is that his life was destroyed by the Starn's heirs and he's been a homeless drifter ever since. His story doesn't mean much if he was able to just quit that job and get another one somewhere else. I think what this reveals is how little Atlas Shrugged actually fits in with the current economic situation. The filmmakers have removed as many of the plot elements as possible that make the situation in the novel more severe than the current situation, and all this does is blunt the message of Rand's writing. It makes it seem as if what she was worried about was nothing and that the colossal forces of evil that seek to topple the gods of capitalism are simply the mild aggravations faced by humdrum, run-of-the-mill business people. It would probably be tempting to say that I'm overanalyzing the film and its presentation. After all, don't all of the big events happen? Doesn't the John Galt line get built? Doesn't James Taggart get married? Doesn't Ellis Wyatt burn his oil fields? Doesn't Dagny fly a plane into Galt's Gulch and almost die in the crash? Well, yes, many of those milestone points do occur in the film, but in an environment devoid of philosophical context, they don't amount to anything significant. Instead, we are left with uh, characters that float about with a seemingly random motivation, changing their personas without cause and acting in vague, almost paralytic states of illogical wondering. This is perhaps no more clear than in the film's cringingly restrained depiction of sex. Sex in Ayn Rand's work seldom happens softly or delicately. It is passionate, ravenous, and violent in its intensity. Bites draw blood, thrusting leaves bruises, clothing is torn to shreds, furniture is broken, rooms are destroyed. It is an unrestrained, brutal act of, on the part of all persons involved, and being the modern-day Puritans that they are, many feminists such as Susan Brownmiller proclaimed Ayn, that Ayn Rand was endorsing rape even though a simple reading of the source material reveals consent. The reason uh, that such passionate sex occurs among the heroic characters of the novel is to demonstrate its contrast with the lifeless, limp, and dull sex had by the novel's villains. We see a hint of this in the film when Reardon has sex with his utterly indifferent wife, but his intercourse with Dagny is equally as dull. Rather than grabbing Dagny in his arms and ravaging her in a manner that reflects the controversial sex of the novel, Reardon in the film is delicate and hesitant, the very opposite of what Rand wanted to portray. The reason that Reardon and Dagny have to be violently unhinged in their lovemaking is that they do not merely represent characters who are attracted to one another. They represent certain philosophical values that, when brought together, are magnetic in each other's presence. Without this violent fire, we fail to see the power of the values that these characters represent. The second fil film deals with sex even more prudishly. The closest thing to eroticism in the entire production is a moment in which Reardon, still fully clothed, joins a sleeping Dagny in bed. Dagny is still wearing all of her makeup and press-on eyelashes, barely wakes up and rolls over to respond to Reardon before the scene ends. 
what should have been an unrestrained, the unrestrained passion of two people who are completely free of the prudish chast de demands and standards of society at large, instead becomes the limp-wristed failure of filmmakers who are painfully terrified of portraying any amount of eroticism in their fumbling modesty. Do not say that the filmmakers were trying to be subtle or classy. There's nothing subtle or classy about the behavior of Rand's characters in regard to sex. Their love of sex is the seething, lustful abandon of porn stars. Reardon should be tow a towering stud and Dagny his bitch in heat. Instead, we get a sweet, sappy, sentimental scene more appropriate to the loss of a girl's virginity in, the, in a coming-of-age picture it, with regards to the sex scene in the first film. But then, what can you expect from the director of One Tree Hill? This prudish, passionless handling of sex in the films may have something to do with their being distributed by Rocky Mountain Pictures, whose socially conservative credits include Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed, Billy, The Early Years of Billy Graham, The Ten Commandments, and other Bible-themed propaganda pieces. We see here again just how hilarious it is to watch the Christian right try to present Ayn Rand's ideas as her own. Face it, conservatives, Ayn Rand was an abortion-supporting, draft-opposing, sex-out-of-wedlock-having atheist, and her philosophy reflects those values. She was not one of, you, one of you, and your pitiful attempt to appear to understand capitalism does not make you her intellectual ally. Ayn Rand's atheism is almost completely ignored in the first two films, with one minor character saying there's always prayer when faced with a hopeless, the hopeless situation of two trains colliding in the second film. This lame punch-in is worse than if, they, than if they'd said nothing at all. You know what he was actually supposed to say in that moment? Who is John Galt? I will close this section with a comment on one of the stupidest lines in both films. In the course of the story, Reardon's detractors blackmail him into giving them his medal by, receiving, by revealing evidence of his affair with Dagny. Reardon gives in to spare Dagny the embarrassment, although without being given under, an understanding of why Reardon gives, uh, gives in, the reason being that Dagny is his highest value and he won't sacrifice her to save his business, he simply comes off as a coward. But that's not the real failure. The ultimate facepalm line in the film is when the government troll that's presenting the blackmail to Reardon describes Dagny Taggart as an inspiration to young girls everywhere. Obviously, this flies in the face of uh, Rand's philosophy. Neither Dagny or Reardon are concerned about being an inspiration to anybody. But the sheer stupidity of the statement actually made me double facepalm in the theater. What young girls anywhere are looking to railroad executives for inspiration? Like the rest of the 2012 election cycle, Atlas Shrugged Part 2 shows us that there's nothing quite as pathetic as social conservatives trying to be insightful about women's issues. <laughs>
when the film was set to open on 810 screens, and I assumed the ticket price to be $9. The film op ultimately opened on 1,012 screens, and tickets were $7.50 at the theater I attended, so I'll adjust the numbers accordingly. There are, on average, between 200 and 300 seats for each screen of the theater. Atlas Shrugged Part 2 played five times on each of three days of the opening weekend. This means that there were between 202,400 and 303,600 seats available for each showing, and, time, uh, and times 15 showings for all three days means that the, there were between 3,036,000 and 4,554,000 seats uh, to be sold opening weekend. If every single one of those seats sold out on opening weekend, then the film would have been would have made between twenty two million seven hundred seventy thousand and thirty four million one hundred and fifty five thousand. So at the very best, the second film could have made back its production costs and picked up the tab left over from the first movie. But the chances of that happening were slim to none. This was not the sort of movie that was going to generate a lot of foot traffic, i.e. people who arrive at the theater, look at what's playing, and decide to see the second part of the mega bomb movie from last year that they ultimately probably didn't see in the first place. This is a movie that is going to appeal to a small a number of specifically targeted fans of Atlas Shrugged, and from within that demographic, a smaller group of people who saw the first film and actually liked it. At the time of the film's release, there were 100,500 100, likes on the Facebook page. If every single person who liked the film on Facebook went and saw it online, there's uh, that's only $753,750. In other words, every one of those Facebook fans would have had to see the second film 14 times just to cover the cost of that film, to say nothing of the first film. The first film opened on 300 screens, so I'll let you do that depressing math. It was not possible for these films to make back their production costs, let alone be profitable, and that should have been insanely obvious to any businessman getting behind these films. When I posted these numbers on the Atlas Shrugged forums, another Atlas Shrugged fan, himself apparently rather affluent, wrote in to thank me for being astute and direct in my observations. He went on to say that hopefully one day the real Ayn Rand fans could acquire the rights to the project and create a proper adaptation funded by making the fans shareholders in the production company. My jaw hit the floor when someone from the current film's production team responded to that message saying, we'd love to have you, and inviting him to invest in the project that he and I were just blatantly condemning as if you needed further proof that the people behind this current adaptation were a bunch of tasteless, tactless assholes. I commented in that original post that the film wasn't going to open to Dark Knight Rises numbers with armies of cosplayers packing out every seat in every theater opening weekend. Ironically, the film's advertising campaign took aim at this very fact with internet posts that boasted, Real heroes don't need capes. Considering that this phrase is built off of the phrase, Real heroes don't wear capes, they wear dog tags, the film's advertisers succeeded in putting out a message with the potential to alienate both Batman fans and members of the armed forces. That double whammy alone is a skill unto itself. Second, we come to the matter of Tea Party support. Given my newly realized libertarian view on economics, many of my friends were wondering if I was going to get in with the Tea Party, which was at the time just forming as the prospect of an Obama presidency became a realistic prospect. I did not join the Tea Party because I saw straight through its pretenses for what it really was. The GOP repackaged and revamped in the wake of the PR nightmare that was W. Sure enough, I was right. The Tea Party carried itself as this cool, forward-thinking libertarian movement for about five minutes, but soon they absorbed the Sarah Palin death panel nuts, the where's the birth certificate nuts, the Obama's gonna take my gun nuts, the secessionist nuts, and Glenn Beck, leaving them, uh, in the, leaving them the cartoon that they are now, a bloated morass of pissed-off white people and a few token Uncle Tom minorities who 
whose collective racial tension, conspiracy theories, and mass hysteria have turned them into an unfocused, agendaless ball of right-wing rage. Obviously, I cannot speak for the intentions of every single member of the Tea Party, but on the whole, I have observed that the movement is hateful, condescending, and belligerent in stark contrast with the values offered in Atlas Shrugged, such as the critical element that no man may start the use of physical force against others. <laughs> Political road rage in Nashville, all over a President Obama Obama bumper sticker. Good evening, everyone. This is the vehicle that was involved in the incident. A man and his 10-year-old daughter were driving on Blair Boulevard today on the way home from school. That's when he says Harry Weisinger flipped him off and rammed into his vehicle. Mark Duran walks us through what happened in his own words. I have an Obama Biden bumper sticker on my car. He pointed at my, the back of my car, my bumper, and then he uh, flipped me off, uh, gave me the one-finger salute. And he laid on his horn, and I moved forward to the stop sign. My turn to go through. He was on the horn the whole time I was, was waiting to move. I went through the intersection and was going up Blair to come home, and I looked in the rearview mirror again, and this same SUV was speeding, flying up behind me. Then he bumped me, and I put the brake on, and then he, I guess he had kept going fast, and he, he smashed into me. And I put the car in park to, you know, deal with the accident, and he started pushing the car with his SUV. And he pushed my car up t towards the sidewalk, almost onto the sidewalk, and fled. Weisinger is charged with felony reckless endangerment. Huh? I love it. I love the hate. 
With her face. We must speak no, out. I did not. That's a complete lie. I was holding she the camera. So I got lipstick all everywhere. over my okay, camera. Needs I was hit. I got yeah. lipstick oh, yeah. all yeah. over my camera. Yeah, we got it on video. We got, I got the girl. It on video, the girl but the girl said she hit me. Yeah, where is the bitch? I didn't do anything. She where is hit me? I was just holding the camera. Mark, Mark, we need to locate this woman who assaulted Chase. I want you as a police officer. We're filing charges to assault. I was standing in the right away when the camera police, right? hit me. She hit her in the face. We got, yes, sir. We got it on tap. Uh, we got it on uh, tape. On uh, tape. I have it on tape. Tap is waiting. Okay. She hit me in the arm. See when she hit me? And uh, she, I didn't see her hit me. Russ, I got marks here, and it's like my lips. Let's go locate all... this woman and have her arrested. She's the okay? one. Come on. Tell me what happened. I'm here exercising my First Amendment on, rights. I've got it all okay. on the tape. Didn't you see when she exactly. hit me? Exactly. And Russ, she, she hit, hit me in the face. Hit her in the face. She hit her in the face. Well, she got her I was standing here, and I, I don't know if you Sir, saw that. I'm trying to talk to her, okay? Not you. Every time I try to, I try to ask, ask her a question, you interrupt. That's very rude, okay? I was standing here okay, what, when all this altercation started, and when she she hit me, I don't know where she went, but Is here in the hurt? face. And what I, did she hit you with, man? Her, her face? Her fist. Her, her face, hand, hand finger, hand. nose, what? Her hand. Okay. She went like that. Who, who, who was it that, that struck you, man? You want to show them the tape? Show them the tape. I can show them the tape. It's, the tape. it's that girl with the, the red hair that struck The red hair. She's the one with the long red hair and the Did you strike? The did you strike? No, after. Oh, what do you think we're doing? After, I, I tried to hit back, but I couldn't. She ran away. Okay. <laughs> show, show me what you uh, Show me what you got. Well, I just I apologize, but I just wanted to understand because I thought to myself, go take your button and toss it, okay? What? What? Take your button and put it someplace. You're not that smart. You can't get me. Does he look that like the men work. in black? <laughs> hey, you're, you're doing a disservice to the United States Marine Corps. Oh, that's a reason. Let me tell you why I believe we're going to get right. Yes. 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 I absolutely do. Looks like he's kissing you. Is he kissing you? Looks like he's kissing you. I spoke to him. Because I understand that even idiots like you have the right to As do you. As you do. As do idiots like you. That's correct. That's correct. So all the idiots have a right to speak. The difference is, I was willing to defend your right to do it. I had a draft card, my friend. But, oh, I'm okay. impressed by that. Why yeah. didn't you go? Because Why you the go? war ended. Because you're a coward. No, the war ended. You're an intellectual. Yeah. Oh, the that's war ended, so that was all, that's all it took. Why should I do I that? I went in in My father died. My father died defending this country Good in ICBM you silos. You I don't care. I don't care what you did or whatever. And I don't care. I don't care what you're doing for your for your money. I don't care. I save lives every day. So again, we got a mental you. midget. I did call you a mental midget, and I will again because not because only you have no other midget, no, you had no other means of uh, you can't of uh, verbal. You can't debate so the facts. Give me a fact. How, what, what's wrong with Medicare for All? What's, what's Criticize wrong with Medicare, Medicare for All. We can't afford it. You, you can't if everybody's if everybody's uh, if everybody. If, uh, you, 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 you. Now, I have a double world. U.S. Marines. Thanks for being here. Thank you for exercising your free speech. Seriously, yeah. Even as we speak, there are people in nations all across the planet that know that there is something better than what they have. That believe that there is a chance. And know that they can be more than what they have done. Because people just... At one point, a man whose sign said he had Parkinson's sat down in front of health care opponents. If you're looking for a handout, you're in the wrong end of town. Nothing for free over here. You have to work for everything you get. 
No, 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 I'll pay for this guy. Here we go. Start a pot. I'll pay for you. I don't want him in now. I tried to. No, I'll decide when to give you money. There, there's another one. There you go. You love a communist. No, start the pot. No more handouts. I know that someone is just chomping at the bit to blame liberal media bias with regards to how the Tea Party is documented, and that will be dealt with in the next section. Suffice to say that my opinion of Occupy Wall Street is about the same. It was idiotic of the producers of these films to assume not once but twice that they had built-in Tea Party support. The films were marketed exclusively through word of mouth generated by Fox News pundits and occasional recognition from Reason Magazine. The assumption was that uh, Rand being waved around by so many people in the Tea Party signaled an intellectual understanding of Rand and a widespread embrace for ideas. This is blatantly not so. As I've mentioned earlier, Tea Party support for Ayn Rand is ultimately like Nazi support for Nietzsche. The vast throngs of supporters don't understand the writings or its messages. They just cobble together a few catchphrases from the various works and hold them up as if, uh, as if they have a fluent understanding of a transcendental philosophy that proves their point. This truth is reflected in the pit this is reflected in the pitiful whittling down of the plot and ideas of Atlas Shrugged to make it palatable to the angry mouth breathers and its audience. Lastly, we have to address the tasteless manner in which Ayn Rand's message and values are handled throughout. In keeping with the bitter, resentful, hateful tone of the Tea Party, the producers of the films continue to stomp around with smug bravado, masquerading as a badly drawn caricature of Ayn Rand's message. For example, the filmmakers have attempted to shift the discussion forums to one of their other websites called Galt's Gulch Online. If you go to this website and attempt to register as a member, you are given one of two options. You can register for free and be categorized as a moocher, or you can have a premium paid membership that labels you as a producer. Okay, first of all, if I use something that you're offering me free of charge, that's not mooching. I'm not trying to weasel it out of you or feed off of you. Also, you've got advertisements on the site that allow you to compensate for the costs of offering the site for free, so I'm not mooching by using your site for free any more than I am by watching NBC. What you're really trying to hide is that what you're asking for is donations. But even more asinine is the idea that by paying for the service, I'm a producer. Hello, this is basic economics 101. Hell, this is what you ought to know long before you even set foot in basic economics 101. If I'm giving you money for a service that you provide, that's not me being a producer. That's me being a consumer. Other revolting merchandising abounds, uh, but none are so pathetic, sick, and wrong as the special edition of the Atlas Shrugged Part 2 DVD. It comes in a copper box with the word Dianconia stamped on the cover. When, I, when last I checked the Galt's Gulch website, someone apparently involved with the merchandising was asking for ideas for an Atlas Shrugged board game. One suggestion I read involved each player having a John Galt piece and their own gulch in the corner of the board. They would be made to move around the board collecting businessmen that they uh, bring back to their particular gulch. I offered my suggestion on Facebook. How about a game where you stop incompetent filmmakers from pissing on Ayn Rand's grave? Final observation needs to be paid to the logo that these people have come up with. The poster for Part 2 was certainly more exciting than the poster for Part 1, but that's not saying much. We are supposed to see an image that conveys Atlas straining with the last of his strength to hold up the world on his shoulders. Neither of these images conveys that. This looks like the statue at Rockefeller Plaza being covered with garbage, and this looks like a Coca Pelli holding a tennis ball. As discussed previously, there is a considerable amount of failure of the film's audience. This is not a matter so simple as not enough people going to the theater. Time and again, I see certain supporters of the film failing to grasp even the most basic elements of Ayn Rand's philosophy. For example, 
I was once on the Facebook page for the first movie, and I and noticed a woman saying that if she lived in Galt's Gulch, she would open a bookstore. A bookstore, really. Okay, this is what life is like in Galt's Gulch. You are living off the grid. Nobody outside of your fellow residents knows where you are or what happened to you, and the whole point is that nobody in the outside world can find you. No money that you make inside the gulch can be spent outside the gulch, and the gulch is inaccessible except by air travel, and even then you have to know exactly where to land because there's a force field cloaking the actual site. How are you going to keep your inventory up? Where are you going to get the bulk deliveries of the latest books? Are there even enough people in the gulch to make it a profitable venture? And if nobody and if no money in the gulch is spent outside the gulch, how are you going to buy books to stock your shelves in the first place? If you wanted to open a lending library and have everybody donate the books they bring with them, that might work, but it's far more likely that capitalists like those in the Gulch are going to understand the concept of trade and just trade books with one another directly. I hate to rain on anybody's parade, but this is exactly what I'm talking about. These people have never, have absolutely no idea what is actually being suggested by the ideas in Atlas Shrugged. Or what about this Tea Party placard that reads, the name's Galt, John Galt. They're referencing James Bond. Okay, James Bond kills people on orders from the government and spends his off time as a playboy. He is the exact opposite of Rand's values. I know people might think that I'm reading too much into such statements, but the wider frame of the Tea Party's actions will make such inconsistencies more relevant. And no, I don't think that that statement was being made uh, in ironic opposition to someone like James Bond. I think they are directly comparing John Galt to James Bond. On the Atlas Shrugged forums, examples abound of supporters of the movie failing to grasp the meaning of Atlas Shrugged. Such examples include statements that are blatantly racist, attempts to obfuscate her atheistic views, and other silly attempts to shoehorn her ideas into more traditional conservative norms. But one thing stood out above all, and that was the idea that these things would get, all of these world issues would get better once Mitt Romney was in office. Here's the thing that these people fail to grasp. At no point in Atlas Shrugged does anybody suggest that life will be better if we get conservatives in office. In fact, specific political parties are not brought up. The government is, the government is what it is, and the party affiliations are irrelevant. As one of my friends who loves Ayn Rand pointed out, look at the word politics. Poly means many, and ticks are blood-sucking parasites. That's all that matters. At one point in the novel, Dagny is referred to as a conservative, but it's by a radio pundit who is at a loss for what to actually call her, which would be capitalist. The point of Atlas Shrugged is not to roll back government regulations. It's to have no government involvement in the market whatsoever. The Romney-Ryan solutions would have simply encouraged more cronyism because they'd be in the business of selling deregulations, and believe it or not, that's not going to be a one-time gesture. Welfare states invariably become self-perpetuating, and this is true of corporate welfare as well. At no point in Atlas Shrugged the novel do the characters actually decide that electing the right politician is the way to go. Rather, they wait for the world to collapse under the sway of socialism and then write a new constitution that says that Congress shall pass no laws restricting the right of free trade. That is, a truly free, uh, that is a truly free market, and that's what opponents of Ayn Rand fail to grasp. We aren't talking about deregulations to be doled out by the government. We're talking about a complete separation of state and business. Mitt Romney believed he could lower the price of gas as president. This is the antithesis of the free market and of Ayn Rand's philosophy. It is not the president's job to take steps to lower the price of gas. If you want to lower the price of gas, you need to increase the value of the dollar, which is a matter of economics, not politics. If you need more blatant proof of this failure of understanding, look to the last third of the Atlas Shrugged novel. The world is on the brink of collapse when head of state Thompson, the de facto president of the novel, is to deliver a speech on the world crisis. 
The speech is interrupted by John Gold, who jams the radio and television signals so as to broadcast his own message on every channel. The message, known as the John Galt speech, is the epic, in-depth exploration of Ayn Rand's philosophy that demonstrates how free market capitalism is not just the best way to do business, but the most compassionate, life-affirming reflection of the nature of reality. It is not a message to vote Republican. It is not a message to go out and yell hatefully at poor people. It is not a message to physically assault people whose beliefs are different from your own. It is a message of nonviolent protest that assures every living person that they have the power within themselves to live and work for their own life and their own happiness. Galt's disdain is not directed at people of lower economic status, but rather people in all economic classes who want to control others with government force. In the aftermath of Galt's speech, the public at large takes to the streets with picket signs begging John Galt to come in and save them, and the government goes on a nationwide manhunt trying to find this elusive John Galt character. Neither the protesters or the politicians actually understand the speech that Galt made, but they recognize an intelligent mind when they see one and know that if they can just get a hold of John Galt and put him in charge, he'll set things right. But Galt does not come out of hiding to save the day. His saving the day was not the point. The point was not to restore and maintain the existing system. The point was to declare that the system, by its very nature, is an automatic failure and has to be allowed to collapse so that something better can be built in its wake. Galt is ultimately captured by the government and asked to take control of the United States economic uh, so as to set everything right. He refuses because he will not use force, the essence of government power, to accomplish his goals. He is not looking for a political solution to the world crisis and refuses the offer presented to him. When he refuses to take control, he is held up at gunpoint on live television and told to present his economic future, uh, plan for the future, at which point he simply approaches the mic and says, get the hell out of my way. Infuriated, the government takes to torturing Galt, but he still refuses to comply. This leads to a psychological breakdown in the character of James Taggart, who, seeing Galt being tortured, realizes that Galt is willing to die before helping the government, but that the government needs to keep Galt alive to save society, thus producing the irrefutable truth that it is the government who needs capitalism, not capitalism who needs the government. The Tea Party and the politicians who campaign to them are nothing more than the protesters who take to the streets begging John Galt to come save them. Yes, there was a prophecy to Atlas Shrugged. Yes, Ayn Rand did foresee the current economic crisis. But she also predicted the Tea Party, that angry mob who takes to the streets demanding help from John Galt. But more importantly, the question must be asked about what Rand's ideas mean to you. When I read Atlas Shrugged, I did not come away from it with hatred for those with less money than me. I did not come away with a uh, hatred for those who were on welfare or other government programs. Instead, I came away, away from it with a sense of hope, a feeling that it was possible to break free of the current rut and avoid future ruts altogether. It made me excited to think about the possibilities of the future rather than dread the worst. I became an optimist instead of a pessimist and felt for the first time in a long time like I could be in control of my life. It increased my compassion and sympathy for my fellow humans because my understanding of human nature went from being something sick and cynical to being something inherently positive and hopeful. I see no such behavior in the Tea Party. The Tea Party has never projected such hope or adopted such positive ideals as its values. At every turn, it has been a seething, angry, hateful mob that ultimately is not better or worse than Occupy Wall Street. It is the antithesis of Rand's philosophies to ram someone with your car because you don't like their bumper stickers. It is the antithesis of Rand's philosophy to stomp on someone's head because they hold up a sign you don't like. It is the antithesis of Rand's values to yell and cast aspersions on someone simply because they can't afford to pay their medical bills. That last example is very important because it reflects the failure of the Tea Party to grasp what is actually happening. In Rand's world, it is totally okay 
for that sick man to ask for help, and it is totally okay for private citizens to pay or not pay for the man's treatment. What is immoral in Rand's world is for the government to take money from the unwilling to pay for the treatment. This is a central problem that people who think they oppose uh, Rand and people who think they support Rand fail to grasp, and one that Yaron Brook discusses wonderfully in the documentary Ayn Rand and the Prophecy of Atlas Shrugged that when people hear that Ayn Rand is opposed to altruism, they think what she's opposed to is benevolence. Wrong. If you choose to help someone, that is benevolence, and you are free to do that as you please within your own means. What you are not free to do is force other people to provide that help. Forcing people to help is what is meant by the altruism that Rand opposes. If you still don't agree, remember that the first thing that happens in Atlas Shrugged, the novel, is that Eddie Willers gives money to a street bum of his own free will. When I went to see the first Atlas Shrugged movie in the theater, I was one of about ten people in the room, and as such, it was easy to watch the reactions that other people had to the events in the film. There was one guy in there in the whole room that seemed very out of place. Whenever something bad would happen to poor people in the course of the film, the guy would laugh and point at the screen in a very mocking, malicious, Nelson Muntz sort of way. He seemed to represent the Tea Party very well, the people who were not who were into Atlas Shrugged simply to laugh and poke fun at people in very bad living situations. He was the kind of bully that is the essence of the Tea Party. Ironically, he held the door open for me as I left the restroom after the film. Even Someone once told me, don't look down on someone unless you're going to reach down and help them. Even in my support of Ayn Rand and free market capitalism, I believe that statement is fundamentally true. The purpose is to the purpose is to live in the service of your own life and your own happiness, not to derive sick pleasure from the suffering of others. That's what James Taggart does. So if you consider yourself a supporter of Ayn Rand, ask yourself if it is because her writing brings out the best within you and makes you feel passionate and happy to be alive or if it is just a justification to stomp around and impress everybody with what a cold-hearted bastard you are. The most hilarious unreality, however, is the willful ignorance that many of the film's supporters had as to why the film is unsuccessful. On the forums, I have seen dissenting voices being accused of being paid bots and other idiocies, but one repeated mantra was this idea that the films were failing because of some liberal bias in Hollywood that was keeping the film suppressed. This is absolute poppycock in the face of the reality that Dark Knight Rises, which was blatantly pro-capitalism, pro-free market, and pro-affluence, grossed over a billion dollars at the box office and received critical acclaim from critics like Roger Ebert, who had bashed the first Atlas Shrugged film. In fact, Dark Knight Rises captures many of Rand's ideas a whole hell of a lot better than either Atlas Shrugged film. In reality, in Rand's morality, erecting a fog between one's self and one's reality is the basis for... Take two. The most hilarious unreality, however, is the willful ignorance that many of the film supporters have as to why the film is unsuccessful. On the forums, I have seen dissenting voices accused of being paid bots and other idiocies, but one repeated mantra was this idea that the films were failing because of some liberal bias in Hollywood that was keeping the films suppressed. This is absolute poppycock in the face of the reality that Dark Knight Rises, which was blatantly pro-capitalism, pro-free market, and pro-affluence, grossed over a billion dollars at the box office and received critical acclaim from critics like Roger Ebert, who had bashed the first Atlas Shrugged film. In fact, Dark Knight Rises captures many of Rand's ideas a whole hell of a lot better than either Atlas Shrugged film. In Rand's morality, erecting a fog between oneself and reality is the basis for evil, and that is exactly what supporters of these films are doing when they attempt to make up excuses for why the films are failing. In one last observation on the failure of the film's audience to grasp Rand's work, 
there was, around the time of the film's first release, a question posed to Facebook users from the film's official page, which was the simple question, if you would choose who, if you had to choose who to take with you from the real world, if you were escaping to Galt's Gulch, who would you take? Uh, one person said Rush Limbaugh because of his media empire. Well, first of all, Rush Limbaugh has a following, not an empire. If you wanted to take away someone with a real media empire, you'd take someone like Rupert Murdoch. Secondly, at no point in Atlas Shrugged does John Galt choose to take political pundits to Galt's Gulch. Such characters like Balf Eubank and Bertram Scudder are left to rot when society collapses. Another person said Sarah Palin because she opened the door for female conservatives, which begs the question, what exactly do you think Sarah Palin accomplished? She quit on her political career to go become a media personality. She didn't do jack shit for female conservatives. And while I'm not conservative, surely there's a more dignified example than Sarah Palin. Wouldn't Margaret Thatcher be better identified as opening the door for female conservatives? But that's irrelevant. Uh, what you remember that Galt does... Take two. But that's irrelevant when you remember that Galt doesn't take any politicians with him to Galt's Gulch, and the failure of the Tea Party to disconnect Rand's ideas from political positions is their greatest and most embarrassing intellectual failure. I'm sure many of the supporters of the films will accuse me of not being able to do any better if I'd had the opportunity to make the films. To answer that, I will tell you how I would have made them and let you be the judge. First, the whole project would be animated. This is not simply to reflect my own fascination with animation as a medium. This technique would suit the project on many levels. First, it would come in well under the budget that Aglioloro spent on even the first film. I did some research and found that the average anime series costs just 145 grand per 30 minute episode to make. This means that on a 20 million dollar budget, 137 30-minute segments could be made. Obviously, a tremendous portion of that budget needs to go to marketing, distribution, etc., so let's only allocate $5 million to the actual production. Well, that's 34 segments, a total of 17 hours. Let's be generous and say that each part of the novel would take four hours to bring to the screen. <clears throat> that's 12 hours at a budget of $3,480,000, with $16,520,000 Remaining, I would score the soundtrack myself and take about $250,000 from the budget, leaving $16,270,000. As for voice actors, it would probably depend on whatever the union scale is, and no, there's nothing wrong with privately operated unions. So I could have Tara Strong do the voice of Dagny Taggart, Jess Harnell do the voice of Hank Reardon, Stephen Blum as John Galt, and so on. This would keep the production well under budget and appeal to the very large demographic of animation fans that uh, follow these actors regardless of what they appear in. I think it's realistic to say that 10 to 12 million could be spent on marketing and distribution alone. But the benefits of animation would extend well beyond mere budget concerns. Animation would allow for the full and exact realization of Rand's vision. Characters could be rendered exactly as they are described in the books, rather than trying to find human actors to embody these shimmering supermen. Then, the world of the books could be portrayed ideally as well. Part of what makes Atlas Shrugged so appealing is its ability to sink the reader into a full immersion world that although portrayed as a near-future United States, is actually more of an Art Deco science fiction realm. Despite being a nightmarish dystopia, the Atlas-inspired video game Bioshock actually does a much better job of capturing the world of Atlas Shrug than one might imagine. Being able to get lost in this retro-futuristic film noir setting was a great part of what made Bioshock so popular, and Atlas Shrug would benefit from this as well. To the matter of the script, which I would write, thus saving even more money, it would 
follow the novel exactly down to the letter along with whatever I could obtain of Rand's original script. Every line of dialogue, including all 60 pages of Galt's speech, would be included without exception. Stanley Kubrick adapted 2001 A Space Odyssey and A Clockwork Orange to the screen so well because of his exacting commitment to the source material. Atlas Shrugged deserves the same commitment. A tremendous example of how to create stirring drama within the framework of the epic Atlas Shrugged speeches is found in the videos of YouTube user XCowboy2, who began years ago adapting John Galt's speech into an epic media presentation. His videos in this series can now be found on the channel Galt Speaking, where the first adaptation, along with the second, are available to watch. By using news clips, portions of movies, and film soundtracks, he demonstrates how a dramatic, almost Koyaanisqatsi like presentation could be made during Galt's speech. Here is a sample from the first adaptation. Fred Thompson, Republican for President. Our country has shed more blood for the freedom of other people than all the other countries in the world combined. We are steeped in the tradition of honor and sacrifice for the greater good. We are proud of this heritage. I believe that Americans are once again ready to achieve this greater good. To achieve this greater good. This greater good. This greater good. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Thompson will not speak to you tonight. His time is up. I have taken it over. You were to hear a report on the world crisis. That is what you are going to hear. For 12 years you have been asking, who is John Galt? This is John Galt speaking. I am the man who loves his life. I am the man who does not sacrifice his love or his values. I am the man who has deprived you of victims and thus has destroyed your world. And if you wish to know why you are perishing, you who dread knowledge, I am the man who will now tell you. You have heard it said that this is an age of moral crisis. said it yourself, half in fear, half in hope that the words had no meaning. You have cried that man's sins are destroying the world, and you have cursed human nature for its unwillingness to practice the virtues you demanded. Since virtue to you consists of sacrifice, you have demanded more sacrifices at every successive disaster. In the name of a return to morality, you have sacrificed all those evils which you held as the cause of your plight. You have sacrificed reason to faith. You have sacrificed wealth to need. You have sacrificed self-esteem to self-denial. You have sacrificed happiness to duty. You have destroyed all that which you held to be evil and achieved all that which you held to be good. Why then do you shrink in horror from the sight of the world around you? That world is not the product of your sins, it is the product and the image of your virtues. It is your moral ideal brought into reality in its full and final perfection. You have fought for it. You have dreamed of it. You have wished it. And I, I am the man who has granted you your wish. I have removed the source of all those evils you were sacrificing one by one. I have ended your battle. I have stopped your motor. I have deprived your world of man's mind. 
I would not market the film or series of films to the Tea Party or to any political organization. I would not try to use the film to rally support for any political cause or try to shoehorn its relevance into contemporary society. I would simply present the story and, in marketing, promote the elements of the story that make it so appealing. The vast potential of the human mind, the individual against the collective, the mind on strike, and the horrific death and majestic rebirth of the human spirit. I would market the film by expressing to audiences why it would appeal to them as individuals, not use collectivist jargon like, get out there and show your support, as the current filmmakers have. If the film were to be distributed to theaters, I would realize that the primary fans are going to be fans of the novel, and as such, I would bank on their being willing to sit through long four-hour blocks of film for each part. Part 1 would be released into theaters, and patrons would be given short intermissions to use the bathroom and visit the concession stand. The following month, Part 2 would be released, followed by Part 3, and all three parts would be made into one, would be made in one production cycle, thus being complete by the time Part 1 was released. I'm actually starting to like the sound of this uh, new animated adaptation. Um, maybe once um, John Agliolaro finally decides to uh, stop embarrassing himself, we can do a Kickstarter campaign to make it happen. What do you say? If Agliolaro, Caslow, and company insist on getting Part 3 made come hell or high water, I will temporarily break with Ayn Rand's philosophy and give help to the undeserving. To the filmmakers, here is how you can get Part 3 made. Go to Germany. There is a man there by the name of Uwe Boll who makes universally despised films but is able to get funding because of a loophole that allows German investors to write off contributions to the arts on their taxes. <clears throat> Strangely, Bowl is often able to get major Hollywood stars into his films such as Ben Kingsley, Ray Liotta, Kristana Loken, Jason Statham, Dolph Lundgren, Tara Reid, and Christian Slater, among others. Many of Bowl's films are based on video games, and many, like Alone in the Dark, are so detached from the source material that aside from the title and a few character names, they are in no way related. Bowl is a master of pulling lame knockoff crap out of his ass, and he'll be able to give this insipid project the finale it deserves. The prospect of a third installment is further nauseating, however, because of Aguilaro's public speculation that the last film in the trilogy should be presented as a musical. See the link below. I am not kidding. John, you have produced two gigantic turds in your filmmaking career, movies that, while purporting to champion capitalism, have been outstanding financial failures. You have demonstrated at every turn that you know nothing at all about filmmaking, and I say with utter confidence that I could do a much, much better job, although that's not saying very much. You are apparently an outside, an outstanding poker player and quite skilled at developing and selling exercise equipment, but you know fuck all about making movies. As an artist, you are nothing more than a fanboy whose masturbatory umbrage has led you to profane and insult one of modern literature's most significant and groundbreaking works. I am personally divided on part three. On the one hand, my OCD wants to see the trilogy completed rather than simply falling flat two-thirds in. On the other hand, I cannot bear what is being done to this book, the message of Ayn Rand and the lessons of capitalism with this pitiful act of cinematic defecation. <laughs> In the end, however, it may simply not be possible for anyone other than Ayn Rand to adapt Atlas Shrugged into film. Rand was very wise in demanding script approval. She knew what the book was supposed to say, not what others were trying to read into it. Perhaps the most poignant response to these asinine films comes from Rand herself in the form of a speech by Richard Halley on the nature of art.
But I mean it, said Richard Halley, smiling. I'm a businessman, and I never do anything without payment. You've paid me. Do you see why I wanted to play for you tonight? I don't mean your enjoyment. I don't mean your emotions. Emotions be damned. I mean your understanding, and the fact that your enjoyment was of the same nature as mine, that it came from the same source, from your intelligence, from the conscious judgment of a mind able to judge my work by the standard of the same values that went to write it. If you are going to adapt Ayn Rand's work to the screen, then it must mirror her values, not the values you want to force into it. There is no event in Atlas Shrugged and no dialogue, however minute, that occurs accidentally or without reflecting in every facet the philosophy of Ayn Rand. To pull any piece is to make the whole structure fall. John Agliolaro has set a bowl of piss at his feet, and it is being hungrily lapped up by a tiny pack of mangy curs who have so deluded themselves that they truly believe they are drinking Richebourg. If there is one bright spot in the flamboyant failure of these films, it is the proof that there are not enough such mutts in the world to drain the piss bowl completely. Make no mistake, you insipid fools who support this tribe. You are not fans of Ayn Rand or supporters of her philosophy. You are pure moochers, the ultimate second-handers who are proudly displaying your bowel movements because the original food was prepared by a five-star chef. I can say, however, that I will be seeing part three in theaters, should it ever be realized. The film's failure is certain, and my $7.50 will not shake that certainty. I will see this through to the end, but only as an act of morbid curiosity. Apparently, John Angliolaro now has the rights to Atlas Shrugged for life. I can only hope that he'll sell them off, and the project will be restarted from scratch in the hands of a competent producer. I will close on a personal note. When I first heard about this Atlas Shrugged film adaptation, before it had the opportunity to go stumbling into the annals of failure at top speed and become a landmark embarrassment, I wrote to Harmon Caslow, Paul Johansson, and John Agliolaro, acting, asking to score the soundtrack myself. I figured since it was such a small indie production, I would stand a better chance of getting the job. Predictably, my emails were ignored. Although highly unlikely, I pondered the possibility that the producers of Part 3 would see this video and, like El the Ellsworth Tuies that they are, try to get me to sell out and embrace hypocrisy by offering me the job. If that were to happen, I would honestly have to think about it. I would think about everything I could do with those hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions and how just one such project would be my ticket into the upper echelons of the economic elite. I would be set up for life and it would require only a couple of months of my time. All I can say is that if that call came, I would like to think that I would have the moral fortitude and character to simply reply, who is John Galt? So, now a short epilogue, if you will. Um, part three has been green lighted, and uh, still no confirmation on whether or not it will or will not be a musical that I'm aware of. But uh, Agliolaro has said that he is including a scene in which Dagny talks to a priest. And uh, this priest, Father Amadeus, was a character that was going to be in Atlas Shrugged, and uh, Ayn Rand decided to take him out. And, uh, you know, it's, it's astounding to me that he's made this decision to put her... Uh, to put him, to put Father Amadeus back into the story. But what's even more astounding uh, to me is that he's doing this in an effort to extend an olive branch, if you will, to uh, Christians. And I'm sorry, but Ayn Rand's philosophy has no, no capacity whatsoever, no, uh, no middle ground on the subject of religion. It is completely devoid of any appreciation for or any sympathy towards religion. And this, I mean, this is the highest betrayal possible of Ayn Rand's 
uh, morale or Ayn Rand's philosophy. It begin her philosophy begins with a defining of reality as that which exists, a focus on the secular, that the secular is the only thing that can be of value. This shows this just validates my thesis throughout this video, which has been that uh, Ayn Rand is, uh, is not compatible with the GOP and the Tea Party and all of this. This is the degree to which you have to go to uh, kind of shoehorn her into the uh, politics of the GOP and the, the worldview. Apparently what's going to happen in the third uh, part of the film adaptation is that Dagny Taggart is going to go into a church and listen to the lovely music for a few minutes and uh, or a few moments. And then a priest is going to come up and ask if he can help her with anything. And she says something like, no, Father, I have to do this myself, and goes on. And... It, it is ultimately a very meaningless scene. It doesn't add anything to the story, but it certainly takes a lot away from it. Um, again, Dagny, lo Dagny appreciates the music of Richard Halley because it is a celebration of life. The, of what, is pre uh, what precedes the, uh, the religious music, the church music, proceeds from a worship of death, a worship of the afterlife, of the unreal. It is totally against Ayn Rand's philosophy and totally against the motivations of Dagny as a character that she would go in a church to appreciate the music. That this is not merely just, this is not merely a matter of um, disagreement about certain minute aspects of the story being changed, this undermines the very foundation of the story, of what it is meant to tell, the values it is meant to impart. I mean, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of, a, uh, a, of an example that, that would really do, uh, really put it in perspective. Um, it would almost be like um, putting a scene in Harry Potter where Harry Potter uh, uh, accepts or comes to some realization that um, magic doesn't exist and uh, Hogwarts exists only in his imagination. I mean, it, it would only take away from the story to do that, and it would only take away from the point of the story to put that in there. Uh, it would be like Luke Skywalker seeing some value in the dark side of the Force. I mean, it, it totally undermines uh, what is being accomplished. Now, to show you why Ayn Rand was so, or how Ayn Rand was so intransigent on the subject of religion, let's look at why Father Amadeus was removed from Atlas Shrugged to begin with. So, if you'll join me on page 140 of... Um, Goddess of the Market, Ayn Rand and the American Right by Jennifer Burns. She writes, Rand's opposition to religion grew stronger as she wrote Atlas Shrugged. The book originally included a priest, Father Amadeus, among the strikers. He would be her, quote, most glamorized projection of a Thomist philosopher, close quote, a character who would, quote, show theoretically the best that could be shown about a man who is attracted to religion by morality, close quote. Over the course of the story, he, she intended Amadeus to realize the evil of forgiveness, and in an important scene, he would go on strike by refusing to pardon one of her villains. Eventually, Rand decided that the priest undermined her larger points about rationality. All of the other figures were taken from honorable professions that she wished to celebrate, including a priest in this company would be tantamount to endorsing religion. She cut Father Amadeus from the novel. And, uh, of course, all of this is lost on Treadmill Boy, but then, uh, if, if you want, if you're not, if you still, I mean, throughout this thing we've been having, I've been emphasizing how the dipshits and the GOP don't understand that Ayn Rand was an atheist and that atheism was crucial to her philosophy, and, uh, so to demonstrate that, I've included a link the, uh, to the John Galt speech. The, uh, pay, it's, not, it's not broken into page numbers, but 
if you want to word search it, it's going to be uh, death is the standard of your values is where I'm going to start. This will hopefully demonstrate how um, Ayn Rand's philosophy, not only was Ayn Rand an atheist, not only was atheism central to her philosophy, but her philosophy does not happen without atheism. It does not function without atheism. She says, or John Galt says in the uh, course of his speech, Death is the standard of your values, death is your chosen goal, and you have to keep running since there is no escape from the pursuer who is out to destroy you, or from the knowledge that that pursuer is yourself. Stop running. For once there is no place to run, stand naked as you dread to stand but as I see you, and take a look at what you dare to call a moral, a moral code. Damnation is the start of your morality. Destruction is its purpose, its means, and end. Your code begins by damning man as evil, then demands that he practice a good which it defines as impossible for him to practice. It demands as his first proof of virtue that he accept his own depravity without proof. It demands that he start not with a standard of value, but with a standard of evil, which is himself, by means of which he is then to define the good. The good is that which he is not. It does not matter who then becomes the profiteer on his renounced glory and tormented soul, a mystic god with some incomprehensible design, or any passerby whose rotting sores are held as some inexplicable claim upon him. It does not matter. The good is not for him to understand. His duty is merely to crawl through years of penance, atoning for the guilt of his existence to any stray collector of unintelligible debts. His only concept of a value is a zero. The good is that which is non-man." The name of this monstrous absurdity is original sin. <clears throat> a sin without volition is a slap at it is a slap at morality and an insolent contradiction in terms. That which is outside the possibility of choice is outside the province of morality. If man is evil by birth, he has no will, no power to change it. If he has no will, he can be neither good nor evil. A robot is Im is amoral. To hold as man's sin a fact not open to his choice is a mockery of morality. To hold man's nature as his sin is a mockery of nature. To punish him for a crime he committed before he was born is a mockery of justice. To hold him guilty in a manner in, in a manner where no innocence exists is a mockery of reason. To destroy morality, nature, justice, and reason by means of a single concept is a feat of evil hardly to be matched, yet that is the root of your moral code. Do not hide behind the cowardly evasion that man is born with free will but a tendency to evil. A free will saddled with a tendency is like a game of loaded dice. Game with loaded dice. It forces man to struggle through the effort of playing to bear responsibility and pay for the game, but the decision is weighted in favor of a tendency that he had no power to escape. If, a ten if the tendency is of his choice, he cannot possess it at birth. If it is not of his choice, his will is not free. What is the nature of the guilt that your your teachers call his original sin? What are the evils that man acquired when he fell from a state they consider perfection? Their myth declares that he ate the fruit of the tree of knowledge. He acquired a mind and became a rational being. It was the knowledge of good and evil. He became a moral being. He was sentenced to earn his bread by labor. He became a productive being. He was sentenced to experience desire. He acquired the capacity of sexual enjoyment. The evils for which they damn him are reason, morality, creative, creativeness, joy, all the cardinal values of existence. It is not his vices that their myth of man's fall is designed to explain and condemn. It is not his errors that they, that they hold as his guilt but the essence of his nature as man. Whatever he was, that robot in the Garden of Eden who existed without mind, without values, without labor, without love, he was not man. Man's fall, according to your teachers, was that he gained the virtues required to live. These virtues, by their standard, are his sin. His evil, they charge, is that he's man. His guilt, they charge, is that he lives.
They call it a morality of mercy and a doctrine of love for man. No, they say, they do not preach that man is evil. The evil is only that alien object, his body. No, they say, they do not wish to kill him. They only wish to make him lose his body. They seek to help him, they say, against his pain, and they point at the torture rack to which they've tied him, the rack with two wheels that pull him in opposite directions, the rack of the doctrine that splits his soul and body. They have cut man in two, setting one half against the other. They have taught him that his body and his consciousness are two enemies engaged in deadly conflict, two antagonists of opposite natures, contradictory claims, incompatible needs, that to benefit one is to injure the other, that his soul belongs to a supernatural realm, but his body is an evil prison holding it in bondage to this earth, and that, to, and that the good is to defeat his body, to undermine it by years of patient struggle, digging his way to that glorious jailbreak which leads to the freedom of the grave. They have taught man that he is a hopeless misfit made of two elements, both symbols of death. A body without a soul is a corpse, a soul without a body is a ghost, yet such is their image of man's nature, the battleground of a struggle between a corpse and a ghost, a corpse endowed with some evil volition of its own and a ghost endowed with the knowledge that everything known to man is non-existent, that only the unknowable exists. I could I could go on, but hopefully that illustrates just the just the severity of Ayn Rand's atheism and what bringing this small scene into the story will do. There is no uh, there is no message for Aglioloro to impart that there is no great uh, here there is no greater virtue that he is imparting all he is doing is pissing all over Ayn Rand's grave and to say that he is doing this in service to her ideas and her philosophy when he time and again creates a story that uh, imparts values that are the polar opposite of Ayn Rand's is complete horseshit.